Danielle, uh, her painting Murakami Wedding is over at the National Portrait Gallery, and it was a finalist among the People's Choice for the Oak Wind Beach Over uh, Portrait Competition, which Thank is a you. very big deal. Yes, it is. And so we have a, a sister painting to that, which is a Murakami painting, and she's going to be discussing her Another Thorny Crown series, um, and hopefully a little bit about the silhouette maker as well. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Darling. Thank you very much. I want to thank you people for coming. I know it's a, it's a rough night. It's humid as heck. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm here because of the Natural Portrait Competition. Um, Amy approached me about being in this show uh, this summer in a museum in a quick, we just had a quick meeting. And I wanted, I latched on very quickly to the idea of having more of my work um, across the street from the Natural Portrait Competition. That has been a big deal for me because of the response I've gotten from the general public. I get emails probably, honest to God, at the beginning once a week, now maybe a couple of times a month, that are the kind of things you live for. People writing you and saying what it meant to them to see your work. And I mean, I was saying to Brandon before, I got a, an email from a guy that said, I don't ever go into art museums. I was showing property, I'm a real estate agent. I had a few minutes to kill and I walked in here and I now missed my appointment from just being excited by the work. I've gotten comments, I've got a relationship with two young women who've written me and said, I am not used to seeing black women portrayed like in the history of Western art, white women have been portrayed in, in grand scenarios. And we've written about that. Uh, so the, the, the Porter competition has been a big deal for me in terms of connecting to the world. A long time ago, I'm from North Carolina. Um, I was born in the early 50s. My mother is a preschool teacher. My dad worked in a dry cleaning store he owned until the week before he died at 82, clean and close. That's when I'm from. And the, I went to Chapel Hill. Um, I was in the second group of, of the second class, they took women very, very long ago. And one of my first painting teachers said to me, all painters are divided into two groups. They're either portrait painters or history painters. They either see the world in a particular way through one purview, one through a portrait, or they see it in a general, in the general political scenario. And of course he picked up Rubens and Van Dyck and talked to us about it. Now, in my personal opinion, Peter Paul Rubens is the finest painter who ever lived, who ever picked up a brush. The man could do no wrong, he could do anything. But personally, I'm more attached to the very particular way that people see things. I've always felt that life is a shocking chaos that only makes sense in terms of particular stories followed through. I feel that art matters to me when I connect with particular individuals in space and time. And that's the kind of art I make. So basically everything I do is portrait painting, regardless of whether it happens to be in a group or not, because I'm going after that particular story. I think about a statement every single day in my life by, us, by um, Sartre that said, life is what you do with what has been done to you. And it's a hell of a starting off point, I'll admit that. But I think about it every single day. Because of the consciousness, what it means to be conscious in the world. And I also was reading recently about Gerhard Richter. Richter said his idea of, his quote about what beauty is, is that which is uninjured. And I thought about it a long time, and I thought, well, certainly that is a correct description of what beauty is. I mean, one can think about that all over the place. But I thought, that is not what I think beauty is. To me, beauty connects when the injury has been done and overcome. And I will admit, I go through museums and know that I should be connecting to certain kinds of painting, Botticelli, Filippo Lippi, and I slide off. I can't, I can't make that connection. So for me, my work was about looking at human beings in time and making those connections. And I can start with weddings. Weddings for me, I come from a big family in North Carolina. I have 17 cousins on one side of my family and 10 on the other. 
And both of my parents are the youngest in their families. So my whole childhood was about being in weddings. Every single June was about being a bridesmaid. I'm one of my daughter, my daughter is 19, saw this movie 27 Dresses. She said, Mama, this is you. Because I had the shoes dyed to match the whole, the whole nine yards every year of my life. And it was thrilling. I was a bridesmaid, then a junior bridesmaid. I mean, every single one of these cousins every year in June, I, that was the big scene that I was going to be in the wedding. But it was also about walking up a plank where I kept thinking, Lord, love a duck every year. This puts me closer to the moment where it's my turn. And what if nobody loves me? And that, to me, is a good image of the artist. The artist puts their work out there like a bride walks forward, and what if nobody loves me? And it's, it's awful. It's awful. It, it, it's a terrible thing. I'll never forget being in those weddings and just being racked with anxiety. You're supposed to be excited. There's some shockingly good-looking guy that your cousin has arranged to take you down the aisle, you know, for that split second you're leaving the wedding. You have fantasies about this guy. You may be 14. I've been 5 feet 10 since I was 11. So I was always placed with, you know, somebody wildly older. And I was married to him in my head by the time we got down the aisle. <laughs> but he didn't know my name. <laughs> you know, so by the end of the evening, that fantasy had really taken a drubbing. And my mother would always say to me, Lord, child, if you could just shut up. People, will, boys will like you. It's who you are they don't like. It's not what you look like. And that fastened upon me at an early age the heaviness of appearance. Every single child in the world has been told it's not what you look like, it's what's inside of you that matters. And every child that has ever been told that knows that that's a kick in the face. If by definition they are saying that to you, they are saying, you're an ugly kid, but oh, you're, you've got a great personality, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a horrible thing to have said to you. And it was said to me over and over and over as a, as a, as a young girl growing up. So weddings are pretty freighted territory for me. And they are the only ritual we still all observe. And the other thing that used to get to me was there's a point in every little girl's life where she starts to realize, I, I hope to God, all that, one thing I'll admit as a feminist, as a woman who's 56, depresses the hell out of me. I have a 19-year-old daughter, and not much seems to have changed. I thought by the time I got to this point, there would be no such thing as an idea of dumbing down for the date. I, I did not believe that would still be possible or in any way desirable. But it still does occur. So there was this idea of you tell your daughter when you're raising your daughter, be everything you can be. Just be as individuated, be as smart as be as. But in the moment of your wedding, the moment, the most important moment in your life, your, your initiation into the society, we're going to dress you as a virgin, we're going to erase all that, and we are going to put you forth as an icon. And insofar as you support your identity as an icon, we will love you. And James Baldwin, my, my, I teach in an art school in, in New York. And every single time I teach, my kids ask me for a reading list. And I give them one thing to read. And it's a reading list, it's one essay by James Baldwin, The Lie of Being White, Whiteness and Other Lies. And the reason I give it to them is twofold. Baldwin was one of the finest writers this country has produced. And his position was one, was a political position. But I start off by saying to them, look, this is the kind of thing, my kids come to my art school and they say, I've signed up with you because you paint flesh really well. I want to know how to paint flesh. And the first thing I say to them is there is no such thing. There's no such thing. Color is a mindset. Baldwin's essay talks about the fact that whiteness, whiteness, our desire to be white, if you're a black person in Africa, you don't know that you are not white. It's simply, it, it, it's a location event, and it's something that America did to get all the immigrants together and to sort of align them in some power movements in some way in which they could initially subvert the American Indian. So it's just a moral position. It's a moral position that did not hold, and it's a moral position that has 
bankrupted our country on a large level. But what I try to say to them is, look, let's do this metaphorically. Let's do this through imagery. Let's imagine, for example, let's read the bald when it always shocks them because they're expecting some treatise on color or you know, how to mix paint. They say, no, what I want you to understand is that color does not exist outside of the canvas you're painting it in. It's only an event that occurs. It's ephemeral. It's only an event that occurs here. I've got a painting that's not here of a black woman and a white woman. The white woman in shadow is darker than the black woman in light. Who's black, who's white? The point isn't that at all. The point is light. I always say to my kids, look, you are not painting flesh color. You are painting an event in light. And I talk to them about Rembrandt, the greatest painter of all who ever understood light as a metaphor for grace. He was somebody who had a, his, all of his paintings about his relationship to God. And light equaling grace of God, darkness equaling man on earth. And I try to say to them, think like that. Think about light. Think about always what you're observing in the light and what the light is telling you about the information. And try to be a Martian when it comes to flesh color. It will always serve you best. It will always make some sense to you. Now, why do I then put white paint on my girls? Part of this is about being angry at initiation rites. The idea of a bride, this idea of rob me of my particular nature and dress me in white. You know, here I spent my whole freaking life, okay, learning to be me. And at the moment you send me down that aisle, you want to erase all that. So my feeling was, all right, let's erase it. Let's erase it in a really grand way. Let's just wipe the whole damn thing out so that you eat your words, so that you see what you're doing in this initiation rite. And at the moment that I was contemplating this painting, Yetta, uh, as a model that had worked for me for other reasons, and she saw a wedding gown in my studio and wanted to put it on. And she had not had a history of being in many weddings as I had. And she just wanted to wear it. She looked ridiculously beautiful in it. And at the moment that I was painting her, at the same moment in time, I got an invitation from my family about a wedding in Atlanta that was going to occur in the Atlanta Art Museum. And of course, it occurred to me, whoa. So the art museum has supplanted the church now as a holy place in which our ideas are held and they are considered important. And simultaneously, in that same moment that I got that invitation, Murakami exhibition was up at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And I went to see that show, and a more nihilistic show I have never seen in my life. Uh, and that, I mean, it purports to be a very gay event, very pop colors, very fun, very fun juxtaposition of pop color. But in, ter in terms of humanism, it's entirely annihilating. And he would say, yes, thank you. I'm, a, I, I'm moving on from what Warhol started, and I, am, I, I appreciate your understanding of that. I stand in the situation, though, thinking, OK, what if my young women in an initiation rite were put, what if, this, what if this wedding were held in the Brooklyn Museum of Art? This is what it would look like. My beautiful, highly individuated girls in his nihilistic situation that purports to be an, uh, an honorable institution, a place where we go, art, we go to art museums because we think the ideas important to our culture are being upheld there, like we used to go to churches. Are they? So that, that's what that painting is about. This one is the second one I did of Janasia in this same situation. I work from life, and this painting went through many, many changes. Finally, Janasia, this gesture, she got mad at me. This arm was out here holding on to some stuff. And she got so tired of it, she just went. And it was such a perfect gesture and such fierceness that I just ran after it. So one of the things I do love about portrait painting is it is quite a collaborative affair. You do feed off the energy of the person in the room. She's seven, and she's little. And one of the things I love about it, she's one of these people who has sort of natural um, uh, regality. You know, she, she's like Audrey Hepburn or something. You know, she walks like, like, like she will look at this and think that the scale is about right. 
And she is, she is tiny for her age, but she's just one of these people that, that um, owns rooms. You know, she doesn't feel that way in her home. One of the reasons that she likes working for me is that she is, I was the youngest cousin, she is the youngest cousin. She lives in a large extended family. So at home she gets short shrift in terms of she's not the brightest, she's not the prettiest. Brianna, this cousin, this cousin is the queen bee, was done twice. And one of the, I'm bringing Jay down here on Memorial Weekend, big deal to me that Brianna, the queen bee, gets to see herself over there, but then Jay gets to see this here. You know, just in the family politics of the, of the thing. Because it matters when people work for you like that. They really try. And they want it to work. And they fight like, hard, like you know, crazy to make it work. And I did her head many different times. I'm looking down at her. This idea of the painting was the flower girl at the Murakami wedding raising cane. You know, the tables are turned over. You're looking straight down at her on the floor. And it's an angry painting. But I'm trying to use a very old Renaissance concept that I teach of moving the painting in a spiral that sends you to the center of the, of the canvas. All right, I, I, this is the kind of thing I teach composition in the school. But composition is only important if it houses an idea, if, it, if, it, if there's some reason for the daggum thing to be there. And I felt with this, with the upturned paintings, that she still has the regality of the pose of the flower girl, even though she's on the ground looking up at you. And what I do with my girls is I feel that I throw stuff at them, and they manage to get through it. They manage to make it through the onslaught of the whiting, etc. The Thorny Crown series. This came about because I was walking with my daughter in, near my florist in Brooklyn, and they had cotton plants out. Now, I was raised for, for decoration, um, to buy for you know, some absurd amount of money for you know, the fall. I was raised by family that my father was a first generation off the farm. And he, anytime anybody would complain about a household chore in my family, my father would roll out the stories about how every single summer, all the grandkids were sent back to the farm to top tobacco. And they were, also had to go for harvest. And I know from childhood that topping tobacco means bending over a tobacco plant all day long in hideous sun and taking the top off of it so the leaves will spread. Once you take the top off, sap comes out, goes all over your arms, the insects invade, you can imagine the rest. This was what his whole summer meant every single year of his life. And so you, 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 you tend to stop complaining about pledging the dining room furniture, you know, when somebody starts rolling this stuff out. And at Thanksgiving, I mean, not Thanksgiving, in, in the fall season, they had to go for harvest. But nothing was worse than those hours topping the back on hideous heat. And they always used children for it because adults, the back, they literally couldn't stand it. I mean, you, you're bending over from the back all day long. My family never had, my, my children, my husband is Jewish and my children enjoy this very much. Um, my husband's family's been in this country about 75 years. They own most of East, of Central Ohio. My family has worked the dirt since right after the revolution and they still work in the dirt. You know, so so my, my kids enjoy the juxtaposition of that. Some of them have done better than that, but this idea of working the dirt working the dirt and making a living off of farms uh, is something I grew up with. And the big thrill of not being on the farm, the liberation of not being on the farm. When my dad in Brooklyn, I'll never forget, he was walking by and they were selling Queen Anne's lace for $5, a, like a little thing full, which is a weed in North Carolina. You, you try to get rid of it you know, at all costs. And my daddy said, baby, they're going to be selling armloads of poison ivy next for $30 a, a bushel. I mean, he couldn't believe it. And the cotton, when I saw the cotton, I thought, wow, that's using a decoration, using as a decoration something that people used to just slave over to get to where it was going. And it gets worse. I had never touched a cotton plant before, not in my life. My family's all tobacco. So I had never, in North Carolina, where I'm from Piedmont, there is no cotton plant. I had no idea what a nasty ass plant that is. No clue. First thing I did when I, I, I bought the thing was try to pull the cotton fiber out of it. 
and I was bloody in a few minutes. And I was a little shocked. I mean, everything, for example, I'm wearing is cotton. It's all cotton. And we consider this a positive thing. And I have never thought for one second in my life what it meant to be the person bending over and pulling that nasty plant up all those years. I bought it. I brought it home. Jay, I'll admit, has never put it on her head. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. This is my fantasy of what it would be on her head. But I thought of it, I thought two things. I was raised a Southern Baptist, quite heavily churched as a kid. And the idea of the crown of thorns being a taunt is something that has stayed with me forever. And I thought about it thinking that all crowns are taunts. You know, whether we crown the May Queen, no matter who, we, we, we elect a president, we set those people up. Yeah, we give them a crown. But it's, it's, I think in some ways the Jesus myth where they've got the crown in his head and there's the taunt of it is the clearest, most honest version of the crown idea I've ever read in my life. Because all crowns are awful. You know, you want to take a shot at that girl in the back of the Cadillac, you know what I mean, who's, made, who's homecoming queen. Nobody in the, in, the, in the whole area likes her. You know, she, she, you know it, it's, it's, it's a nasty thing to, to wear a crown. And at the same time, you're supposed to feel grateful. You know, you're supposed to curtsy. That fact, this idea of innocence, this little girl does not know all this is up ahead. She doesn't know any of this yet. And yet, she and I talk about it some. She knows some. But these ideas of beauty, um, she feels beautiful with me. She's little and in her family is not considered beautiful. I was big and my family was not considered beautiful for that reason. All those kinds of things keep getting, you know, pop back and forth between us. She kind of half lives at my house at this point. All of these images are about this idea of the desecration of beauty. And for me, unlike Richter, beauty is not what isn't injured. Beauty is what is injured and survives. I always think about, it. I've done a lot of paintings of dwarves before I started doing this because of looking at Velazquez, okay? You know Las Meninas by Velazquez, a little golden girl in the center. I recently was told that, I, no, I couldn't believe it, it was a, a lecture of a friend of mine and he pointed out that, that the woman who's handing up that little red bottle, you know, to the, to the princess in the golden center of the Velazquez, it's a whitening compound. Now these were ugly German inbred people in Spain, the Habsburg family. That jaw, I mean, God forbid. I mean, they, they were hideous people, right? But the idea of keeping themselves white, to keep themselves projectable, in other words, non-identifiable, was everything. I associate, I look at the dwarves in that picture. Velasquez and the dwarf are looking at you. The little girl looks at you a little bit too, but she's in this cloud of gold. The dwarf and Velasquez are the, are the locations of intelligence. They cross her gaze and look out at you. That's the message of the painting. That suffering, diminishment, creates intelligence and creates actual awareness of being on this earth. The little golden child in the middle died. I mean, we never know a conscious moment on this earth. And this idea of whitening go, is in every single culture. One of the reasons I do it with the Japanese culture, the freaking uh, geisha girl thing. Every single culture, even cultures that knew nothing about each other, and the African culture as well, whitened. And the reason they did it was to create a ghost or a spirituality to basically erase consciousness. Like when we go into a cosmetic counter, Bloomingdale's, and we look at those girls and think, man, they're probably good looking behind all that. You know, or where there's somebody home there. But that, that sense of mass, that sense, again, back to the wedding, I will love you if you disappear and allow whatever I need to love to appear on you. So that's what the whitening is about and has been throughout time. Good heavens, Queen Elizabeth whitened herself. I mean, uh, Marie Antoinette almost died of lead poisoning from heavy white paint that she applied. There's white. I mean, you know, these are very white people, but you couldn't get white enough. It was to be a goddess. It was to erase your humanity. And what I'm interested in painting is the attempt to erase humanity from people who will not allow it to occur. 
These, this is a seven-year-old girl who has m a, more strength than the, than the push of her culture to annihilate it. And that, that's what the work is about. Now, any questions? Yes, Maureen. She's holding it, yeah. Sir, sir, sir. Sure, sure. Uh, and the detail wasn't to diminish who she was, but goes back to something you said about the original. Yeah. Well, I guess I consider that a diminishment. Yeah. Absolute whiteness, this Well, the geisha concept, I mean, the Japanese will tell you, I mean, I, sh I, sh I shouldn't do that and reading about the geisha concept, it was to sell old meat. <laughs> now that means, you know, you've got, they, they whitened in order for the woman to look younger. And that started the whitening of the geisha, and then it became so popular, and the markings on the neck, that became sexy. There's a mark on a geisha neck where they leave, they, they, they make a mark on the white and it goes back, and that was considered an erogenous zone. So, but just, Maureen, just the freaking need to, yeah. yeah, to annihilate you. Going back to that old thing where I, you know, I'd have friends of mine say, look, you can get the date you want, just shut up. But what do you have if you've got that guy to go out with you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, that whole thing of shutting up. Okay, yeah, all right, he's going out with me, but I'm not me. And what is, I, I mean, what did I win there? And yet it's still with us. That's the part that kills me. Sure, sure. But, you know, 19 today, it's like Honey, my, most of my students are female. I teach in an art school where I'm one of three women teachers. Most of the student body is female. So subsequently, we get the questions. You know, the, the women get the questions. I'm only penny teacher. And the questions haven't changed since 1976. And that's, that's a little, you know, when people say to me, I live in a post-feminist, post-racial world, do you? You know what I mean? Because I would like to be introduced to that area of the world. I haven't seen it. Um, but, I mean, God bless. You know? And, and, and I don't mean that the militancy, I, I do think that people have to work this stuff out in particular ways. And what I'm trying to do painting by painting is work things out in a particular way. Um, but it, does, it, ha it doesn't seem to have diminished much in my lifetime. Oh, thank you, Maureen. Thanks very you, much. You, you thank you. Pay tribute to her and her whole, her whole life ahead and all of her traditions. Just I hope. I hope, Maureen. I'm painting, I'm doing a painting of a woman, a white woman in white paint. I was going in, um, I was walking, I was taking my kids in the Met, and there's a portrait of Isis. I mean, I, I actually was this wonderful find, never in the Egyptian section. And it, Long story short, there's this painting of ice, I mean, a sculpture of ice is just standing up like a glass case, this wonderful sort of slight curve to her body. And she's covered in white paint. And I thought, mother of God, you know, I mean, never. So, but it was just this wonderful thing where you could see the terracotta give way and the white paint be part of it. And she had been shaved, all the body hair, either had been removed or there had been so much intermarrying, there was none anymore. So Bedenda had been painted in this black triangle. So everything was an abstraction. So I thought, okay, to go to bed with this woman. I mean, just all of those things, like 
so it's all an abstraction, or it's an abstraction if you wish to worship it, but what does that mean about when you get home? All of those thoughts I had with this painting. So I've got a model of mine is white that I covered in white paint, and I have her in a bathtub where it's just loosening and coming off into the water. So it, it's not located to a particular I don't want to locate it to the black culture. I don't want it to be about that. It's the most, in some ways, Jane and I have a big relationship. It's one of the reasons I work with her more. I mean, you get kind of led by people, but also it's very obvious in this, these scenarios, more so. Um, and the cotton thing is the most obvious thing I've ever done. It's the most obvious move into that realm I've ever made. And, you know, it's made me nervous for a long time. But I'm still, I'm still working with it a little bit because it does seem to have some resonance. I mean, I, again, you get on email, and God bless the, the internet for that. People write me in a kind of an angry way or a questioning way, and I can write them back, and, and you know, you, you get conversation about it. And it's good. Yes? Uh, so I have a question about the expressions, or I want to call them lack of expression, or very slight expression on all the faces. Yeah. That Thank you for noticing. <laughs> no, thank you, because I work really hard on that. Um, and it drives her crazy. Uh, I, I work, well, again, I work a lot without her there also, of course. Um, I wanted this to be angry. I wanted this to be wistful. I'm doing, I'm starting a selection of paintings working with um, Kara Walker's silhouettes. The idea of making silhouettes. Um, and I've got her in some situations making silhouettes. I want, one of the things I want to do, one of the things I, as, a, as a female teacher in my school, my kids say to me, um, I have a close, well actually I'm paint, doing a painting of him as an African, an African student, who says to me, well this is not my culture. I said, baby, it ain't mine either. We got Rose Von Ur, Mary Cassatt. Where do, you, where do you think I land, all right? My culture is needlepoint, okay? So get over that. You know, you just, just pick up what you want, pick it down where you want, and, and he soared. I said, David, do you ever think one minute about where you land? It's all yours. Everything is your inheritance on this planet that you can put your hands on. And you don't have to, you don't have to curtsy or care about that. I said, if, if women artists did that, we would be needlepoint. This is it. This is all we actually own. I mean, that's all we have. And because we weren't allowed, I mean, what you've got, Cassatt, Fabulous, fabulous artist. You've got Rosa Bandor, who was a pretty great artist. And then you've got women who worked in their husband's studios, basically. And so you look at the work and it goes, looks a lot like, and it's his wife. You know, over and over and over. So this is not somebody inheriting a tradition and moving forward with it. So my feeling about her is I want her to walk into Western art and take it, inherit it, and her to take over paintings. I've got uh, some paintings, again, with her wall, literally walking into a scenario that is a Western art scenario, and she just moves the people around and is the character in the middle as a defiant act of, I own this, too. I own the space. And one of the reasons I work very hard to get actual space is for that to happen. Yes? Do you believe that um, what you see is part of what you experience? It's a great question. It's a great question. You don't see what, hun? I see very little of what you discussed and how you came to those points. Meaning? Me meaning yeah. that my, I do believe that some of what you see, not all, but a good deal of what you see is what you experience. Mm -hmm. what you bring to it. And for example, that, her expression, which is the, the, the last The one and the last, the last one, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So, but yeah. But what I saw was what I see is that she she said um, almost like it's oh, now uh, in my print. Like, no, I know what you mean. So well, but you're equating the idea of white. I mean, this is something she and I talk about. For example, 
she, I started working with her when she was six. And one of the things that happens, I, I was a portrait painter for many years, and I learned with painting portraits of children, they're not getting anything out of it. The mom, I loves it, but I would always go out and buy them a toy at the end of every session. So she and I go out, I pay her mother, but we, we buy a toy at the end of every session. I could never get her to buy a black baby doll. It drives me nuts, um, ever. Under any conditions, or I, I mean, it was just, and that really freaked me out. Like, why are, we, why are we always seeing it, this is the beautiful act? Why are we getting the white Barbie, the white baby? I mean, every time it felt, I'm a white woman walking back into that house with these armloads of white baby dolls. And yet, I did start to see this connection. And it's a leap. I didn't feel more beautiful than Jay does and her skin. That is a metaphor I am trying to make in the sense that what the culture reads, going back to the Baldwin article, whiteness doesn't exist. It's a construct, this country put together. He, he makes this wonderful point that you've got Norwegians, you've got Jews, you've got Germans, all these people, they weren't necessarily white in their country, but over here they had to become white to annihilate, first of all, the American Indian and then to keep the slaves down. Okay, so it was a construct in which they gave up all their moral high ground in order for, to keep safe. And what I kept, took from that Baldwin article was that concept of safety. My mother is saying to me, erase who you are, become this bride because some man will keep you safe if you do that. And that's the connection that I make back when I'm with Jay. This idea of, okay, I will conform to some idea of beauty the world expects and they'll keep me safe. But it is the opposite of being conscious. It's, it's the absolute opposite of becoming a human being. And what kills me about wedding rituals is that women keep doing this to each other. Men are just bystanders in, wed in weddings. I mean, have we, you know, it's women. This is our initiation right, and yet this is what we do. Over and over and over. And I keep thinking that the white weddings, the white baby dolls, and my mama saying to me, stay out of the sun, you freckle too easily. I mean, it just doesn't end. You know, get your hair a little blonder. I mean, I am pretty white. But it wasn't white enough. It wasn't as white as my cousins who were blonde and blue eyed. It's just never enough. And if you go down that road towards annihilation, as Baldwin said, Baldwin's point was, this country has annihilated its moral ground to, to keep some kind of safety for itself, and, and there wasn't any. They gave their soul away for something that didn't exist. And when my kids read that, mostly, I mean, I, I, it kills me at my age, they, I, I walk into classes, they've never heard of James Baldwin, they never heard of Saul Bellow, they never, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's shocking how quickly the, the, the curtain comes down. But they leap to it. And I found with essays especially, they can grab that fast. And they grab it and they run with it and they come back to me for book lists. I, I, I was an English major at Chapel Hill, not, not a, an art major. And I still see the world like that. My best friends in Brooklyn are filmmakers and writers, not artists as a rule. And they are the most helpful to me because they see what I'm trying to do and they see the struggles. Um, and it's, it's dangerous, you know, it's very dangerous for me to tread on this. I know it. I'm, I'm frankly very grateful at, at how kindly I have been treated at this point. It's quite true. Yes. Anybody? Yes. What's the, what's the next subject matter you want to start painting? Good question. I am doing white women and white paint, but I'm also doing, I've got, uh, and this is going to light the root well. I'm going to say it anyway. I've got this, this young, um, beautiful black man who's posing for me. He's doing, I've got him in wedding scenarios again, and I don't put the white paint on him. And I think to myself, what the hell is that about? I do associate it with cosmetics and women things, but I don't do it to him. And he even stood to me, and he was laughing because he's posing with Jay, in which I put the white paint on her which he has trouble with, but he's, but he's my student, and we talk about it, he wants to paint some too, so it's a little bit collaborative. But he says, so when it, when's mine? And I said, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't consider it. And I don't, and I don't really know what that, that's about. But I'm doing paintings of him with her, 
I'm doing paintings of her making um, silhouettes, treading on Carol Walker's ground. But then Carol Walker was treading on the first act of portraiture. First act of portraiture was an amateur act. Also, I found this out that blew me away. Silhouette, the word silhouette is a man, a Frenchman's name, the French tax collector. And he was somebody who just made silhouettes as a parlor game. He was so wildly unpopular in France from collecting that he, uh, tax, taxing people incorrectly that, or overly, abundantly, that he was cited as one of the reasons for the French Revolution. And the, in all over the countryside, people would dress in solid black to mimic, to be silhouettes. So this is a heavy, heavy background in history, this concept of silhouetting. And I want to play with it. I want to play with what Kara Walker's doing with it. I want to play with the fact that it's a homegrown event, that people did this in their parlors forever. The first portrait of my family had no money for portraits, but they had their silhouettes, you know, because in, in grade school, you know, they line you up and they draw that and they cut it out. Everybody's, my mama's got all three of us. And Walker took that and ran with it, and I, that is one thing, but it's, it's about, I've got another couple of paintings where she's walking into a Velasquez um, and putting on that white wig. That same thing I talked to you about, this one, I'm out of my mind for trying, but I am doing it. Um, doing the little central girl in the Velasquez of Jay holding up her dress in a white wig with the Velasquez slightly behind her to talk about that central figure of gold. I've got Jay in a fright wig in front of an Andy Warhol that I'm working on right now, playing with um, that, just what happens when people play with identities. And what's great about this little person, this little girl, is that she cuts through it all the time. You can't blank her out. She, she's not possible to eradicate. So every time you put her in a new scenario, she pops through it. So you, I just think of them all the time. And I've got some paintings I'm doing with Kenyatta. Kenyatta now has a baby girl. And I'm doing a painting right now in my studio of Yetta in this bridal dress. And Kiki, who's a year old now, is not in white face, but is standing like this on the dress, defying the act of, of that. So that's this one I'm working on right now. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, African American or Long East African descent portrayed in such a way that you all no longer see them. And then the extra layer of that, so then I Google and I try to read John Shear after that, and to find out that you were a person of non color who was daring to, yeah. you know, to act just like she, I thought that was just phenomenal to. Um, Thank you. Because that's a bold step. Thank you. Um, Sure, yeah. And he's like, so that, it, I think it, it, um, it creates a different dialogue and a level of, you know, sometimes with some people probably more tension with others and less tension to explore that concept and how we construct a, and race as a social sure. construct. And then for him to do it on the overlap of women, I think it's interesting. Thank um, you. Thanks very much. And then, I think it's awesome. That's great. I've been told more feminine. Yeah, yeah. 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 But what did we get then? Yeah. So then, but yeah. Then in that, you would not get me. So I understand, like, in the same con, you know, uh, as much as like this, this is what, you know, woman, you know, we are imagining the ideal of, you know, what it looks like on who she is and stuff. But if you move into that, then you lose yourself in the process. Yes. I have a, thank you, honey. I have a friend who's a comic, and I adore comics. I honestly think they're the greatest living artists. And 
what a friend of mine is a shrink. I was talking about somebody who was humorless. He said, Margaret, comedy is a coping act, like art. People who do not need to cope do not laugh. You know, they don't, and it had never occurred to me in all my life, well, of course, they're humorless because they didn't have to be. You know, they didn't have to come up with some way of staying alive. And he said, well, of course you love it. Art is a coping act. You know, you can't, the world is chaos. You make some sort of construct in which you feel at home and which mirrors your idea of peace and what it should be for a minute. And that's, that's what you get. Yes, ma'am. You know, the, had I not heard your lecture, yeah. uh, I had a totally different concept wow. of the mural. You know what I thought, what I thought was so powerful in the, the, the other piece that you mm -hmm. had? Mm -hmm, sure. But it was, for me, an ability to see someone that we have traditionally shunned in this society to go through her because the, the dignity and the grace in her face was such beauty in context of this crown of cotton in our history that I thought was just so powerful. Thank you. Well, if, if That's the way I well, no, it's not so different. I mean, Christ, the whole idea of Christ was, is a construct. Right. It's a Jewish rabbi that we've whitened to death. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, the, 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 the big picture that hangs, in, the only painting I ever saw until I was nine years old and was taken to the field trip to the, Nash, to the museum in Raleigh was a painting in the chapel of my church of a blonde, blue-eyed Christ. Please. So it, it, it was, it's always been this, this desire, and also that whole thing of the crown of thorns was always skated over when you got to Easter. Because that was something people didn't want to talk about either, that there was a mocking of this. Well, when, when I saw another thorny crown, immediately, you know, no. that's why. But I, I, I thank you, but I, I meant it in, the, in the idea that here are people of real worth, that are covered over by so many meanings that have nothing to do with them and still survive. I mean, I mean, even still manage to have, hold their dignity and their regality. And it, it's, I'll admit I was scared to death when I started doing these paintings, well, I mean, I these drawings. I yeah, I know. <laughs> I actually have a very close girlfriend who's black who said, let me just front for you and we'll just slide through this whole thing. She said, you will not have to deal with this stuff. And I did, I'm but not, you know, I did think about it. It was so beautiful. I did think it, about it. It was handled so beautifully. Well, it's. It, it was, you could tell whoever painted had, had love for, for the You know what you just said, Willie Middlebrook is a great mentoring artist in California, is a black artist, big mountain of a man. And he's mentored me from the beginning. And Willie said, baby girl, you're going to have trouble with white people. Black people are going to leave you alone. And I said, Willie, why? And he said, because it's so obvious how much you love these babies. And he said, that is a connection we can, you know, that anybody can make. He said, you're going to make the white folks very nervous. And frankly, you know, it, it has been true. But he was immediately embracing from the first moment that I ever sh showed him images. And he's a very militant black artist from the, I mean, you know, I, I thought, okay, if I can get, you know, this past Willie, then I, I'll be all right. And he's, he sent other artists to me, I mean, nothing but, but embracing. But, uh, you know, you tread on very tough ground here, you know. Hopefully, but you know, one of the things I talk, we might talk to my students about, dealers will say that, but the truth is, like, Abstraction is the impressionism of our time. You know, a woman, who, a woman whose grandmother bought a Manet haystack, she's got a Frankenthaler. You know, I mean, you, you don't really, which people will say, I mean, as a friend of mine said, who's a fashion designer, and I was, he's right, I was being um, 
just visually dismissive in a conversation, just being quiet. And he said, don't you think for one minute you're not involved in couture? Because it's all about couture, baby. In other words, it's just about a few rich people can buy your work. And he's completely right. You, you can't appeal to a large group of people. And in that fact is, is a lot of brute, you know, looking at the market. I, I had a dealer in New York say to me, look, we say we want something that's very you know, interesting, but the truth is rich people would like when they come into their home for the art to register that they are in the know and that they have money. So I thought, okay, well the best thing I could do would take a sob and flatten it in the junkyard and hang it. And he actually said to me, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not the worst idea you've had today, you know. Um, but, and I understand, and, but his point was that has been the function of art from the beginning of time, to support power, to support power. And now you are making subversive paintings and asking people of power to buy them. He said, this is very unusual. He said, if you, he said it's just a game. He said, but it's the truth. Look at, look at, it was a kind act. It was a kind act on his part to say to me, too much, too much, too much. You know, like this is, this is okay because this happened. Or he, he used Fischl for an example. He said, or you lead us in by little bits and then hit something bigger. But you, you have to acclimate the audience to the place where they are, they're not scared that their dinner guests were going to think badly of them for purchasing the item. You know. Oh, Morgan, I what? I hope. Yeah, and in fact, I think the university collective collections reflect more what our society is interested in today. And I think there's going to be a back door experience of uh, Catherine and Tite. They are the ones who have been supporting. Yeah, I hope you're right. For the last 20 years, at least. No, I hope you're right. I mean, what I've got friends who are historians, and they grouse about the fact that they've been supplanted. I mean, it used to be that that um, reviewers had a life. You know, there were all these museums, I mean, you know, magazines, they could write articles. And now, any rich man, I'll never forget, in my own school, I, I, we have this lecture series of various artists that come, and I love this series, right? And I had gone to one, it was great. I bring my friend Saul Arbor with me next time. Saul, this is great. We sit down, he turns to me, he says, you gotta be kidding me. And he knew the pedigree of this artist. And he said to me, this is a German artist. He gave the name of some guy, some big industrialist. He said he went into Germany, walked through 15 studios, bought 250 pieces, put them in a warehouse, and made a decision about creating worth out of these pieces. And he did. And he said, wait till you see this work. And it was staggeringly numbing. I mean, it was just, wow. You know what I mean? And it was also just pick, you could, in any art school in the country, I mean, there's five of those people. It was like a lottery win. So the, the, the writers get mad at the fact that Saatchi, you know, that there, that there are people going in and just saying, I will create wor worth. And I will create worth by stockpiling, like they did diamonds. I'll stockpile. They learned, I have a friend who's an investment banker, and he said, you got to understand that there's no such thing at, like, as wonderful as art in that it's an unregulated commodity. This, this is worth what I say it's worth. He said, there's nothing more delicious than that. He said, so then you got it into the hands of a few people that could go, you know, just ran with it. Witness the Picasso. Well, because it was a real art, yeah. Four million or something like that. Well, I see what you're saying now. But that, that doesn't bother me. I mean, that man's a real artist. What bothers me more are the, are, you know, the, the skull, the Damien Hirst skull, the, the diamond, Mishagas, that stuff is more upsetting. Where it's just, it's just those guys over there fighting over money. And the writers over, you know, there, there's, there's, there's no connection anymore between, and you're right, the, the, the universities do provide what there is. And the museums, I've got a museum show, I'm very grateful. Uh, Thomas Styron is director of the Greenville County Museum of Art in Greenville, South Carolina, has offered me, has given me a, a one-person show from November to February. And of course, for me, to have that in the Deep South is a big deal, too. So they are the big... Thing to go to next. I know you guys have been here a long time. I'm very grateful. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs>